Hey, shoujo fans! This is part two of our Violent Voice recap. So let's dig in. If you would like to hear our soft serve summary and also our floats your boat for a silent voice, please listen to the previous episode since this is the second part of us talking about a silent voice. So now we are going to get into our new segment called Rocky Road, which is us talking about the scenes that made us cry. So. Gianna, would you like to start? So really quick before I jump right in, I know that we put a trigger warning on our last episode, but I do just want to reiterate that A Silent Voice, aka Koe no Kitachi, is a very heavy film and it deals with suicide, bullying, the death of a family member and depression and maybe amongst other things I can't think of right now. If that isn't something you feel you can handle listening to, Maybe skip this episode for now. We have some other Made Sama content you can check out, but we're going to dive right into the real sad stuff here. Yeah. So I think the very first thing that really made me well up is the breakfast scene. Of course, I, I love Mama Ishida. She doesn't even ease into it. She lets her son take one bite of his egg, gushes for a second that he left her all the money he owed her for Shoko's hearing aids, and asks him right out, why did you try to kill yourself? And it's clear that he doesn't want to explain. He just mutters that he's been through a lot of stuff. And she throws away her fake smile and hollers at him, saying she could tell something was wrong and threatens to burn all the cash he put his sweat and tears into if he won't promise not to try and kill himself anymore. All Shoya can see is the pain he caused her five years ago, her bloody earlobe from when her earring was ripped out by Shoko's mom, and he has to force himself to concentrate on the pain she's feeling now, having almost lost her only son. He sincerely apologizes, saying he, quote, won't do it again, and she makes him flat out say, I'll stop trying to kill myself. He, like, screams it at her. I just cry through that whole scene. And I super appreciate the comic relief of the burning money and everyone scrambling to put it out. And then the added dates on the calendar immediately to follow. Yeah. However, if I was going to banana split this, I know it's Rocky Road. It's for sure more of a Rocky Road point than a banana split. But the only thing that I really didn't appreciate about this scene was that this conversation happened in front of Maria. She doesn't need to know that her uncle tried to commit suicide. Right. I think that, I mean, that scene also got to me because she just knew it. Mm -hmm. And because she just knew, she asked in such a nonchalant way. Yeah. She did it in such a way that it's like, I guess, to see if he would actually like admit to it, to see if he would respond to the way that she said it rather than her being emotional right off. But I think I had it also in Ice Cream You Scream because Maria was there. Right. I feel like Maria is this precious little tiny tot. She goes to school, but she it has to be either preschool or elementary school. And so I think that children can easily pick up what's going on. They can pick up words. They can pick up vibes. And so I think exposing Maria to that conversation, I don't think that that was the right thing to do because you never know like what exactly she's going to pick up from that. So like, what if she kept hearing Mama Ishida talk about suicide? What if she just drops that word like in conversation when she's at school? She could very well traumatize the 
other people that she goes to school with if they've lost a family member in that way or if the caretakers have lost a family member in that way. I think at the same time, it could also alarm the people that are taking care of Maria. So if she's at the school and she brings that up, then, and I feel like another added layer to this is because the fact that Maria is like mixed. I feel like she's mixed, but then at the same time, she's not like more light skinned. So I feel that there's probably already enough curiosity about who Maria is, what her family is like in general. And so hypothetically, if she starts dropping words like that and they're paying attention, like what if they do like a welfare check? If Japan has something similar to like child protective services, what if they're just like looking for a reason to like look into her? Like, and I mean, I'm not saying that they're just looking for a reason, but if she brings up something like that, like what if all of this could have gotten replaced with like another family, like the way that we have foster care here in the U.S.? Which I know that that's like really on a grander scale, but this is all hypothetical. This isn't something that actually happened in the film. But I'm saying all of this to say that this isn't the type of conversation that you should have in front of the child. And I think on top of that, them having that conversation and we don't really see the aftermath of Mama Ishida with Maria talking about it if that happened but there's also like another thing of asking a child to keep something like that a secret I just children are like innocent they're mostly open books so something can happen at home and they'll just repeat what happens at home and so putting the weight of you need to keep this to yourself for our family I feel like that's something else that I just don't think that a child should have to deal with and I say that as a person that was put in that situation not to say that somebody in my family tried to commit suicide when I was a child and I had to keep that as a secret but in general, hearing certain things or being aware of certain things that are like traumatic and then being told, well, to protect our family, you need to be quiet about this. And I think that that's just a weight that shouldn't be put on children. So I didn't like the fact that Mama Ishida did that with Maria. I think it would have been better if Maria had already gone to school or if she just waited to have a conversation or go to a different room where she's not there to have that conversation. Yeah, thinking about it, this might quite possibly be the most frustrating thing for me. Like, I know that there's plot stuff, but it's intentionally and supposed to be frustrating. This doesn't feel like it was intentional, and it was such an easy thing that they could have written out. Yeah. Maria didn't have to be there. Yeah. The more layers that you put on it, there are so many terrible ways it could go and spin out of control, and she's so small. Like, what a weight. Like, when you're that little, you shouldn't start collecting weights on your shoulders yet. Yeah. And I think it's already enough that she's, like, different because she's mixed. Yeah. And I think in general, like, when you are a child that whether you're fully Black, whether you're mixed, you have to be aware of so many different things, even at that young age, like how to talk to certain people, whether you're talking to like law enforcement, whether you are talking to school officials or whatever, you have to hold yourself accordingly, which I mean, I think when it comes to this, I mean, this is also like a whole separate conversation, but there are so many things that you have to be aware of, even when you're that age. And I just feel that family secrets is the last thing that Maria would have to worry about. Even if she has to be aware of her race, she can still be a child. And I feel like adding in those sort of secrets when she's that small is unfair and it would take away from her overall childhood. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. One of my Rocky Roads, I was already crying at the beginning of the film because of Shoya just getting his affairs together. Because that's how A Silent Voice starts out. You just see Shoya like going to his job to go quit his job. You see the calendar that has all the X marks to say that he's done this and he's done that. And I feel because he was 
getting his affairs in order because he didn't plan on surviving. I feel like that was a lot for me because, I mean, I said this in the last episode and we had the trigger warning in our last episode in this one. And so as somebody who has attempted before, I feel like there is this place where you just mentally like get to or you're just trying to check off your boxes if you're even planning it in that way. Because sometimes it happens, there are no plans, there's no note. You just, you try and you're either successful or you're not. But I feel that just seeing him do all of that, it was really just in your face. And because I didn't expect that at the very beginning, I was just like, oh, okay, we're just, there are tears. And so I was happy at the fact that the firework went off and it sort of snapped him out of it. And I think also just to connect it to like the last scene that we were talking about, even his mom making him like promise not to do it. I think when you're talking to somebody and they're suicidal and you're trying to make them promise not to do it, that doesn't mean that they're not going to do it. They're just saying what you want to hear to placate you. So her like, I'm going to burn your money or whatever promise me not to do that doesn't mean that he wasn't going to do it in fact even at the end of that scene he still had plans on doing it It just wasn't as concrete but it was just like okay well let me make amends first with the wrongs that I've so he still had plans to do it I mean, I'm not going to be the one, I'm not the person to tell others how you should handle somebody when they are suicidal and like what to get them to say or like what to do. At the most, it's just they need help. And so having some one-off promise, that's not a guarantee that it's like not going to happen. There should be more to that conversation and it shouldn't even just be a single conversation. But that was something that got to me. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. I would like to think that Shoya and his mother would talk more in depth about what it is that led him to that point because he didn't seem like he wanted to go into any kind of detail. He just almost like shrugged it off and said, I've just been through some stuff. You know, I've gone to places mentally where there's been some ideation and you feel like you want to talk about it, but it doesn't feel like it matters because... That person doesn't have the answer and neither do you and it doesn't feel like it's ever going to come to you. So I understand kind of why he shrugged it off. It it was more of a struggle to talk about it because then he would have to think about it and be reminded that there was no answer. Yeah. And also he probably didn't want to hurt his mom in that way after hurting her so much over the past five years or in particular five years ago. As he continued to tick off boxes, it's just so good that the next thing he went to do was what turned everything around. Yeah. And even, I feel like there is maybe a grain of something to the promise he gave his mom because it's evident how much he cares about her and seeing her cry seemed to evoke something in him. And I mean, to make it personal, I guess, I don't know how much I've talked about my cat on the podcast, my little Soleil. I've had her for seven years. There have been several times over those seven years where she was kind of my main reason for being around (laughs) because of the way she looked at me and I knew that she needed me. And if I wasn't around, then her life would be so sad. I feel like that's silly to say my pet in comparison to this boy and his mother, but maybe like the way she cried and begged him to promise was that grain of something for him to be like, I need to rethink this. I need to just hang on and see if I can just continue to check the boxes, but see where it goes. And at least you know, it it turned around for him. Yeah. Thinking of it now, I think it would have been good if the film had depicted more of the impact of him wanting to commit suicide, what that did to his family. Mm -hmm. I think realistically, when something like that happens, everybody is on eggshells and there's like a change. So just like the fact that, you know, like he just ended up going back to school or whatever, like I feel like an added scene of his mom like watching the door a little longer after she saw him walk out. Or we don't get to see his older sister, but maybe even seeing like his brother-in-law trying to be around or to say something. I feel like... And I mean, there are families like when you do something like that and it's just kind of like 
not necessarily that they shrug it off, but they don't show the impact to you, what it meant to them. And it just feels as if it's business as usual, I guess. But I think it would have been nice to just get that. But I'm guessing, I mean, maybe that could also go back to the whole promise thing that he made the promise and she believed it. So she didn't feel like she had to become like a hovering parent, like post. Yeah. Yeah. But I do agree. I think that maybe just a little bit added affection or concern even in the background would have added a lot to the family aspect of the film. Yeah, even just, let's say, like his mom asking, like, what have you been doing? Or like, what have your plans been? Because from what I see, he never went back to work post his attempt in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense for his mom to just question like, what are you doing when you go out? Yeah. So then she would know the fact that he's trying to make amends with Shoko, or at least she would be aware of it much earlier on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that we talked about the X's on people's faces in the last episode, but I can't, I can't not put them in my rocky road. So the very first time they show the exes on screen, we're at school and Shoya is walking through the hallway and everyone around him has a blue X drawn over their face. He can't look at them. His gaze falls to his feet and he covers his ears to drown out the noise of the conversations he isn't included in or could be saying hurtful things about him. And I think I said in the last episode that there were times where I felt like I could relate to this, where like everybody around me had an ex and it just immediate tears. Yeah. Yeah. I know that so many people say this, but quite literally, I feel that it's just so much easier and better to just be kind to people. Absolutely. We don't know what everyone is going through unless they talk to us about it. People aren't just going to unload their troubles onto someone that they've never spoken to before, unless it's like their first time meeting like a therapist, but they're not going to like do that. And so sometimes just saying hi or even if you can't say hi, like smiling, not to say you should smile when you don't feel like smiling, but if you see them and you can like smiling or just being generally like a comfort to people in that way of trying to be positive or trying to be open in there. I think it goes such a long way in making people's lives that much better. Yeah, for sure. But I think in general, just like the people in class, I also feel that it's a little, and maybe it's just because we grew up in the U.S., I do feel like it's slightly unrealistic that everyone is saying something bad or negative. I'm sure that there are people who have access who didn't say anything, but I also feel like someone would have at least tried to say hi or to talk to him. While I perfectly understand him having having that exes on all these people's faces. I just feel like the general sentiment towards him didn't necessarily make sense. Right. I do think that a lot of the exes, and this is my own interpretation of it, they are probably perfect strangers to him. And I think it's him in his own mind thinking they already have people and I can't infiltrate that group. Right. Or maybe they know about me. I shouldn't bother them. I can't trust them. I don't know them. So I can't look at them. I'm too scared to look at them. And that's the way I interpreted some of it. And of course, the other parts is like his old friends telling people that he used to be a bully, don't associate with him. So I think it's a mixture of his own self-hatred being projected onto others and also gossip and people only having an image of him in their head from five years ago. Right, right. Now that makes sense. I think, what is that like quote? I'm sure it's from the Bible. Guys, don't ever ask me to quote the Bible. I have not been <laughs> practicing in years. But it's like, don't throw stones. Oh, gosh. It's like, you can't throw stones if you live in a glass house. Yeah, I think that's it. Or like, he who is blameless cast the first stone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
see her better than, yeah. I I went to Catholic school for 12 years. (laughs) I mean, my family is still like very Christian. I feel like I've just not, I haven't practiced in a very long time. But yeah, yeah, I feel like this would definitely go for that because the same people that were saying that, it's just like, Kawhi, you don't have any room to talk. Mm -mm. You also didn't do anything. And sometimes not doing anything is worse. Yes. Because then by not doing anything by not sticking up for Shoko. It's worse because Shoya is doing all that stuff to her that was like terrible. At least Shoko had an idea of like who he was at that time back when they were in the sixth grade. But Kawhi and Ueno for both of them to just be very two-faced and like, oh, well, in your face, I'm saying this, I'm, I'm acting like a friend, but behind your back, I'm saying, it's worse because at least she would know what to expect if you were being the way that you were truly being. Yeah. Like, if you actually said what you felt about her or wrote what you felt about her. But by being two-faced in that way, it makes the situation just terrible for Shoko in that she thinks that you're her friend, but you aren't her friend. And like, because she's deaf, she can't hear the snide remarks or whatever and know like, okay, this is who I need to protect myself from. Mm-hmm. So she's more vulnerable and like them exploiting that and then turning around and acting holier than thou is complete and utter bullshit, which I didn't mean to get into this because this is like hot fudge, Loki. <laughs> but- yeah, no, we'll get there soon. Yeah. It broke my heart to see Shoko being bullied for having a disability yeah. because she was and is like such a nice girl. She's just a little different. Right. But she's so nice and just open. And I hated seeing her being bullied because they just couldn't be that much more understanding of like her situation. And it's not as if she completely hampered everything that was going on. She did her best throughout the film, but especially when she was younger, like having to stand up and read on cue. And it's just kind of like, does she really have to do that? Right. Shitty homeroom teacher. But anyway, but like, you know, like she's doing that. She's singing and it's like these are something like she's watching people she doesn't technically like know how to do it or to do it in key you know but she's still like ultimately like trying and just because she was deaf like they made it seem like it was the biggest burden in the world and it's not and I just I guess in general it just bothered me how ableist everybody was being towards her Mm -hmm. and I just say that I blanket statement that I made a blanket statement and saying her being bullied like in the sixth grade bothered me and made me cry but I would feel especially what really got me was when Shoya ripped out her hearing aids yeah but then he did it and there was the time when like her ear like started bleeding Mm -hmm. oh my gosh I was like sobbing because I was just it was so unnecessary Shoko just wanted to be loved and accepted and so I feel like the reason why she ended up being bullied for so long is because she didn't speak up against her classmates because she still wanted to be accepted by them even though they were harming her like physically harming her being mean to her she wanted to be accepted and seen as normal in a way that she didn't even voice the pain and like the hurt that she was going through so the only time we see some sort of intervention is when the principal comes out and it's because her mom obviously has noted that she lost at least eight hearing aids and stuff and so she knew she was being bullied and it's just kind of like I felt so much pain in my heart for her because even if she's different I wish that Shoko had loved herself enough to say something to her mom way earlier Yeah. so then she could have just been moved to like a different class or even moved to to a different school a lot faster than to be putting up with this consistently and all she wanted to do is just be like everyone else yeah and I think what hurts even more about that is what you touched on that she didn't love herself enough or have the confidence in herself to believe that she should stand up for herself yeah she she notes later in the movie that she always hated herself 
So, I mean, that's that's what I gathered from, from that. It's just so sad. Yeah, that like she felt that she deserved it. Maybe, I don't yeah. know. Like, mm. and It's possible. Obviously, if she's in elementary school, I'm sure that Yuzuru was like too small to really maybe not yeah. learn to do anything. But it's mm-hmm. just, it was just really like heartbreaking to see that. Oh, I guess another thing I could add on to that is after Shoya and his mom have to like go to make amends to like Shoko's mom and then he like walks off and finds Shoko. I also cried at seeing her like play with the pigeons because not that people can't do it, but I just thought of just how lonely she was that she could only like feed pigeons and stuff to have some level of of companionship because they aren't going to do the things that have been happening to her in school. Well, yeah, I didn't even think of it like that. I thought that she was just sort of sitting there waiting for her mom. But I mean, I guess we see when she's grown up, she's still going out and feeding animals. So that very well could be it. Yeah, I think you definitely know better than me. Like, you know, the animals are just kinder. Like, if you are able to provide for them and everything, like, they just love you unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Which I guess that's also, like, a separate thing of, like, it would have also been nice if they had a pet. I don't think that they did. It didn't seem like it. Yeah, so I think that's the last thing I have before the amusement park. Okay, so at the amusement park, Shoya catches himself having fun and feeling like he belongs. But his residual guilt makes him wonder if he deserves to feel good after his childhood atrocities. And I just, I mean, oh, the way it was shot was so beautiful too. Almost like a dream sequence of him like having this out of body. Wow, this is what fun feels like. I forgot what this is. Oh my gosh, I, uh, I think I might have had to pause it because I started crying so much. Yeah, like he just never had that reprieve, you know? Yeah. And sometimes like you'll go into school and you think that it'll be different now, like once I'm here. And it wasn't because he was still around like the same sort of people. And it's just sad to see somebody question whether they're worthy enough to have fun or to be happy about something. I mean, maybe even in him not talking to people or not reaching out to people, he was also punishing himself. Very well could be. That's for sure a possibility. It was just like subconscious. So like him having fun, it goes against what he's been subconsciously putting himself through at the same time. Mm Mm-hmm. After the amusement park, Yuzuru goes to Shoya's house and then shows him like the video of Ueno just saying all of these things to Shoko. And that definitely made me cry because Ueno, I just, she's so selfish. And I think just assuming that Shoko also hated her, it was just asinine because it's like you haven't even spoken to this girl legitimately since she transferred from like your elementary school so to assume that she would be bothered enough to hate you when like literally her main tormentor was Shoya doesn't make sense and then she's saying all of this stuff and it's just like you being hurtful to Shoko isn't going to make Shoya want you no Oh my gosh, no. It's not going to change anything because the main reason why all this stuff was happening, like Shoko was Shoya's main motivation to be even going to the beginning of this film. They would have never even met again because if he'd been successful, he would have been gone. Mm -hmm. So to just assume that we both hate each other and it's okay. And it's like, she's literally apologized. It was just so sad. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. I have thoughts about away now but they're all in ice cream you scream so i think i'm gonna hold off but i'm not a fan yeah 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 so we're at the climax of the story shoya walks in as shoko steps up to jump off of her balcony to end her life he screams her name and runs after her to save her as the fireworks blast in the distance shoya is someone who has been in her place before he knows in his own way, exactly how she's feeling at this moment. Shoko helped him realize that life is worth living, yet she doesn't want to be alive. The thought of losing her is something he can't bear. In a panicked prayer, he begs God to give him the strength to save her, 
And he'll continue to make big improvements, starting with huge immediate changes like looking people in the eye properly and listening to them to simply do things right. He wonders if she was still angry about the sixth grade and he fears he'll never find out. He doesn't know what she thinks of him and he fears he'll never know. As she accepts his help and climbs up towards him, Shoya can't bear the weight of them both and he falls in her place. And like the minute he sees her out on that balcony is when I just, the the tears start. It's such a heavy scene. Yeah, yeah. I think that, and I think it's because of the fact that we are getting Shoya's point of view. That even though we have a general sense of how Shoko feels about herself, we just don't know how bad it is until we see her on her balcony. Mm -hmm. And I ultimately would just say like, you know, the words that she was saying, I think it was just a combination of different things, like her own self hatred, being in contact with people that were also blaming her for what happened, feeling guilt at how Shoya's life was, also losing her grandmother, who was like so selfless and loving and just a constant presence because we don't see either one of their fathers, Shoya's father or Shoko's father. Yeah. All of that culminated into her feeling like she would just be better if she wasn't there. And so just hearing him praying to any, like not even just just to anything like, oh, if I could just hold out like longer and then her finally like helping and then her getting up there. It was just, I couldn't even be sure if I was crying at the fact that she was just ready to go and then she did it in the way that she did or that I was crying because like he was finally able to help bring her up there and all of the stuff that he was thinking about of the things he never got to tell her what they never got to experience having all of those thoughts and then him falling himself it was just like I was just crying at everything yeah I mean, he's reaching out for this girl who gave him life, essentially, and knows so passionately in that moment that he wants to live and he wants her to live with him. And then he tumbles off the balcony and I I absolutely lose it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. At the hospital. I mean, I don't know if I even stop crying between scenes, but at the hospital, Yuzuru and Mama Nishimiya just bowing to the tile floor in front of Mama Ishida for Shoya having saved Shoko's life. Yeah. And then Shoko outside with her arm in a cast, just bowing to the pavement, guilt stricken and devastated and, you know, hair a mess, clothes a mess, just all of that. My heart's like ripped out of my chest, like trying to comprehend to even the tiniest degree, the heaviness and, and the pain that they're feeling everyone in that moment. I mean, the, the movie accomplished portraying that pain beautifully. But my God, do I cry. Yeah. Seeing them bow all the way to the tile. I mean, this is different situations, guys. I fully understand that. But like when Shoya's mom was apologizing for what, how Shoya tormented Shoko and like Shoko's mom wasn't forgiving to then her like bowing the way that she did to Shoya's mom. And Shoya's mom is just, I feel like she feels so many things and I wouldn't even say that she didn't feel a way inside but she's just in general such a forgiving person Mm -hmm. so it's like you're crying because it's such an emotional scene and especially seeing Shoko just being so devastated because she made this attempt and she survived because of him I think the arm that's in the cast probably broke when he was trying to like I think that's the arm he was holding on to yeah I was guessing it was like a dislocated shoulder or something just because you know hanging on like that is all I could imagine. Yeah. And then her like apologizing to his mom. And even in that moment, like I think I noted this in our last episode, but like when Shoko feels really strongly about something, she wants to say it in a way that people understand. Also, I mean, of course, her arms in a cast, but still, it's not like she signed that she was sorry. She just kept saying it Mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Yeah. Just asking for her forgiveness because at that point it's really just added guilt because her surviving 
I don't even feel like it negated the fact that she was suicidal, especially when you have your attempt and it doesn't work out. The last thing that you want to feel is added guilt. And she couldn't not feel that added guilt because he was in a coma. I'm sure she blamed herself even more than she was prior to that because she felt that she destroyed his life. And then even in saving her, she felt like she destroyed his life. Because what if he didn't wake up, you know? Right. Right. Oh my gosh. Like just thinking about it, I could cry again. Yeah. So shortly after the hospital, we find out Yuzuru's real reason for taking photos of like dead creatures and dead bugs. She says, I thought if she saw these, she'd stop trying to kill herself. And then her and her mother just stand there staring at the photos and start sobbing. Like, I wish I had something more eloquent to say about the scene, but it's just so sad. Unless it was, like, dead bugs. I thought she was taking pictures of, like, whatever. No, yeah, it was, like, dead creatures and dead bugs. Damn. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through this bit without crying, but... It's a lot. So Shoko goes to see Kawai and Mashiba in the park. And what Kawai has to say makes me absolutely sob. And I'm going to try to get through this without crying. So let's see. She says, everyone was worried about you. Everyone suffers in their life. But it's like that for everyone, right? You have to love the bad parts of yourself too and move forward. And as I said in our last episode, I think this is a huge message that the movie wants to portray. And, you know, I've had my own struggles with mental health and in life and stuff, and as we all do. And I'm trying to find the right balance between accepting the mistakes I've made, accepting my faults, but always trying to be better and grow. And I mess up. I mess up a lot, but it's okay. Mistakes are allowed, even though they aren't easy. And that's why I sob. I sob a lot during that scene. I think it was something that she needed to hear. Yeah, she really did. I think it gave Kawhi some, it gave her more added depth. At the same time, I feel like I would have preferred it if um, Miyoko was the one that said it. What is her name? Sahara. Sahara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. I think I would have preferred it if she was the one that had said it just because it was hard for me to just sort of reconcile what Kawhi didn't do back when Shoko was being bullied Mm -hmm. to then saying what she said. Because while what she said was like true and Shoko needed to hear it, without Mashiba being there, I'm not even sure like how meaningful it is. It's still meaningful, but it's just like, does Kawhi actually mean it with Mashiba not being there? Because I feel that the way that Shoko is Shoya's motivation to do better and to be a better person, I also feel that with Kawhi, Mashiba is her sole focus. So when Kawhi just starts talking about how Shoya started bullying people and she told everybody because of the fact that he confronted her about what she had told Mashiba and she wanted to displace that blame, she brought out what was most obvious to kind of redirect attention from her. Mashiba was also there at the time. And so it's like, I'm glad that she said those words because Shoko needed to get that from someone. I just don't like that it was her because I can't really attest to her true motivations. Like, are you being kind because you want to be kind? Or are you being kind because you don't want to show a negative side of yourself to your significant other? Because he is actually kind. I hadn't really considered that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, I hadn't considered all of that because that's definitely plausible. Yeah. And I mean, because I did also cry as well. It's just that knowing that about Kawhi or at least having those questions, it took me out a little bit. Yeah, I think it was more so the general message of it. Because I mean, those are words I think a lot of people need to hear. Yeah. Not just Shoko. Yeah. I also think, or at least touching on the same scene, but sort of is just that Shoko started going to all of Shoya's different friends. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I said this in the last episode, but she started going to all of their friends friends, all of his friends, to let them know what happened 
so that he could have people again because she noted that back when everyone stopped hanging out with him, he was only dependent on her and Yizuru, that he was also in some ways lonely because he liked being around those people, like how it was in the amusement park before it went bad. He liked being around those people. He liked having a good time. But ultimately, his main motivation was like Shoko. So if they weren't around, that's fine. As long as he's able to have Shoko and to have her forgive him, that was the most important thing. But Shoko was aware enough to know that he liked having more people to talk to and to have actual friends. And so I thought it was just so kind of her to go to each of these people and explain what went on to first dissuade them into thinking that he was trying to kill himself because he was really just trying to like save her and then to also like let people know that her being a past like victim of his bullying accepted him forgave him and wanted other people to see how he portrays himself more recently rather than to just hold on to what he did in the past. And so that made me cry just seeing her try so hard to get all of these people to value Shoya again and her trying to give that gift back to him of trying to have people around him the way that he was trying to have people around her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She's just so pure hearted. Like after the bridge and everybody kind of like going off and there being so much conflict, she saw that that affected him and she wanted to solve that for him so that he could wake up to peace. And it's just so sweet. Yeah. So finally, Shoya wakes up and the first thing he thinks of is Shoko, still concerned for her. He reaches out for her like they're still on the balcony. All he wants to do is make sure she hasn't hurt herself. He runs out of the hospital, no stamina, in search of the girl who gave him vivation for life again. The way they look at each other on the bridge when they meet is heart-stopping. She pokes him to make sure he's real and not a ghost. I'm glad you're okay, he says. He just came out of a coma and his concern is for her, not himself. He explains that he's fine, more or less, but Shoko can't stop crying. There's so many emotions she must be feeling. Relief, guilt, ecstasy, her romantic feelings towards him, happiness to see him, sadness that he's weak. He takes the opportunity to apologize for bullying her. He thinks bullying her made her hate herself, leading her to be suicidal. She denies this, saying she was always that way and never changed and it's her own fault. She thought things would be better for everyone if she just disappeared. He wants to comfort her. He says, I want you to help me live. What a vulnerable thing to say. She's the only person he knows who could possibly understand what he means. After he worries, he said something creepy, which is like the perfect, most adorable comic relief that was so desperately needed. She finally smiles, and this makes him laugh despite the heaviness of it all. He's just so happy to see her smile. She was already helping him to live all this time. He just hadn't fully realized it. That's all I got on that. (laughs) I'll just, I'll say that it was a little too perfect that he like woke up and went over to that bridge. Oh yeah, I know. It was very uh, cinematic movie drama of it all, but yeah. I I mean, I'll take it, but. (laughs) Yeah, suspension of disbelief for sure. Yeah, but you know what? Maybe it's just like on a molecular level, he was just so connected to her that he knew he had to go to the bridge. They were like kind of talking in a dream. Right. Well, I mean, she, to her, it looked like she was like going to die. Uh huh. Which, I mean, that happens sometimes, or at least when people are in coma, like depending on how severe it was. So she just assumed that he said goodbye to her. And so I feel like she got to the bridge, but she probably would have went all the way to the hospital when she was able to catch her breath and stuff. But I think, yeah, him asking her to help him live. I thought that that was so beautiful. Yeah. Also codependent. Well, (laughs) yeah, I mean, these are two very damaged people. Yeah, trauma bonding galore. I'd like to think that post this, they could grow stronger together and be better for it. 
but that's me liking to wrap things in a bow. Right, right. No. And the thing is, like, I would also do it too. I just feel like the realist in me is just like, or at least the person in me that's went to therapy a couple of times is like, I know what this is. (laughs) I can identify it. But I think it was just really beautiful to just see him apologize to her and then ask to live. And like, Meanwhile, I think I said this in our last episode, is the fact that Shoko like loves him and he just doesn't know it yet. Yeah, I have I have stuff about that later. Don't we'll get there. Don't worry. Right. So it's just like he's talking about helping him to like live and like she's just fully all the way there and stuff. And I guess it also gets to him like not feeling worthy enough to even mentally think of that point. You know, but I'm just so glad that they were able to resolve that in one one another and to become stronger in that moment. It was so needed and it felt really good as a viewer to like watch it happen. Absolutely. Such a beautiful scene. That's actually all of my Rocky Road because we touched on my stuff at the festival in the last episode. So I'm ready to move on to Banana Split when you are. Okay. I'm also ready. All right. So Banana Split. So I didn't realize that Shoko's mom had like attacked Shoya's mom. Yeah. See, the way that my head was at, I just thought maybe there's somebody in the picture that got mad that she took all that money out. And that's what happened when they found out that she took that money out. Oh. Like sort of like a pimp, but not really. I thought somebody else did it. I didn't realize it was Shoko's mom. And so I didn't know how to feel about because I was just like, why is she bleeding? I was so concerned. So I just didn't get it. So I put that in my banana split. Yeah, no, the way I interpreted it was she went back to go talk with Shoko's mom and give her the money. And Shoya was kind of creeping around Shoko at the waterfall with the pigeons. And when he sees his mom again, she has her earring ripped out and her earlobes bloody. So I thought that. It was Shoko's mom who kind of decided to throw hands. I guess. Yeah. It's not like she can fight a kid, so I guess, but... I'm not not saying she should have done that, but that's the way I interpreted it. Yeah, yeah. I guess you just never really know. Like, maybe Shoko's mom just assumed that she had the same feelings and just acted out. But I just think because of the fact that his mom, like, came and gave the money and how sincere she was, it's sad that she just didn't pick up on Mama Ishida's sincerity. Yeah. Not that I don't get it because I feel like for her to be, like, so frustrated and, like, to see how many times, like, that her hearing aids got ripped out and how expensive that is. And, like, the way that I see it, the money that Shoya's mom gave was probably for one pair of ear hearing aids. And he had ripped out, like, eight. Yeah, I have no idea what the... Like, how much, right? Yeah. I think they mentioned the exact amount of money in the scene where she threatens to burn the cash at, at breakfast. So... I mean, we could go back and do the conversions and try to figure out how many earring aids that would cover. But I got to tell you, I don't have the time. (laughs) Same. So, yeah. But regardless, it's just, I didn't know what had happened, so I didn't know how to feel about it. Uh, What about you? So in the sixth grade, I do have one banana split. Firstly, super rude of Oeno to try and tell the teacher that it's inconvenient for her to learn sign language rather than write in Shoko's book. But then immediately, Sahara stands up and says she'd willingly learn and then immediately befriends Shoko. So it's a split because part of my friends but fuck Ueno and we love Sahara. Yeah, fuck Ueno like the whole movie. I don't care about her. Yeah, I hate her. The re- redemption thing that they try to, man, fuck that. No. Oh, no, we will <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we'll get there. Let's just wait to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fudge is coming in hot. It's coming in piping hot, y'all. Be prepared. <laughs> I'm going to be dropping all of the profanity, the explicit we have beside our podcast is coming in for this episode. Oh, yes. Okay. Something else that was in my banana split was Shoko's mom. Maybe just Shoko's mom should just permanently be in banana split. So (laughs) when he walks Yuzuru home and Shoko's mom sees him and slaps him, I was just like, girl, your child ran away. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have that. Where do I? I think I have that in my I scream, you scream about the slap. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like, because it was at a point, and the reason why it was in my banana split and not in the ice cream you scream is because she wasn't able to, and obviously I realized this late, guys, so I didn't know that Shoko's mom had hit Shoya's mom. I thought that was just some somebody else. But when she hit Shoya, I was like, okay, it's not his fault that Yuzuru ran away from home. Right. Loki, that's your fault. Why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you do whatever? Missing child like that sort of thing especially when she's I guess she's in middle school she's not in high school or whatever I don't know if she's in middle school or she's in elementary school you know when a child goes missing after a certain amount of hours you just assume that they're passed away because you don't know if they've been taken by somebody. You don't know if they've run away, but usually it's like, oh, if they got taken, like you only have a certain amount of hours before you only think of the worst. Right. So I didn't like the fact that she hit him because it's just like low key. She really would have been, user would have been back at your house if you had alerted the authorities because I'm sure they would have been looked around the different areas. Like they probably have their own form of animal. Amber Alerts. Amber Alerts in the U.S. It's like if a child is taken and the parents or the guardian tell the police in enough time, the police will put out an Amber Alert that will automatically go to every single cell phone in the in, in the U.S. Well, at least in the area, I believe. Every single cell phone to tell people this child has been taken. If they know the vehicle, they'll say the type of vehicle to be on the lookout just in case that if a random by Sander is driving and they see the car that the child was taken in or they see a car that was similar to like the description that was given, then a bystander could then call the police and be like, hey, I'm at such and such street. I just saw this car over here so that the police can go and get within that path. So like with Yuzuru being gone, now obviously it's not an Amber Alert situation because it's not like she got taken, but we also don't know that. Well, not we. Her mom Mom doesn't know that. So it's just like if you after I think maybe it's eight hours here anyway, after a certain amount of hours, you tell the police that your child is missing and then they like go tell other people to be on the lookout. So there are search parties and stuff. So to be honest, in my opinion, Yuzuru could have been found prior to Shoya finding her. But Shoko's mom hitting Shoya, I put in my banana split because of the fact that obviously she knows that Yuzuru didn't run away because of him, sort of. But she was slapping him for what he did to Shoko in the past. Yeah, I can imagine she wanted to do that for a long time. Yeah. And the circumstances probably looked kind of weird and kind of bad with him walking Yuzuru home in the rain. Yeah. But I don't think it's justified to slap the kid. You know, I don't. And that's why it's like I didn't know how to feel about it just because he was so bad in elementary. So that's the only reason why it's my banana. Yeah. If he was so bad to Shoko that it's like I didn't like it. She didn't need to do it, but I understood it. And this is because of the fact I didn't realize that she had also hit Shoya's mom. Now, if I had known that, I would have put it in my ice cream, you scream. But I'm just saying true to what I saw in my notes. <laughs> so that's why I have in my banana split. So Shoya asks Shoko to be friends immediately after giving her back her notebook. And I feel like it's coming from a good place. But I also think it's a little much to expect after brutally bullying her for several months five years ago. Right, right. I just thought that, I mean, he made a mistake. He didn't mean to ask her that. Right, he did kind of blurt it out. That's why it's like banana split, kind of not so deep, but... Yeah. Yeah. I would also put that in banana split as well. Cause it's just kind of like you wanted to ask if you wanted to be friends with her. And I literally, I think had he not given her that notebook, she would have just said no or run off. Yeah. But because he had kept that notebook, so she knew that he had to go through the fountain thing to go find it and that he kept it for how many, like five years, I guess. So he kept it for five years. Mm -hmm. He learned signed language. All of these different gestures, it was enough for her to say yes. But I think at the same time, he didn't mean to ask her that. But I also feel like he didn't feel worthy. So if she had said no, then he would have accepted that as well. But I get why you put it in banana split. Yeah. I only have a couple more. I think it's sweet to see Shoko and Shoya hang out casually kind of later in the movie. 
Everything was feeling so heavy for so long in the film. It was nice to get some reprieve. That is, and it's in Banana Split, because until he remembered how he used to treat her, it was like a flashback moment. He just can't escape the guilt. Yeah, I think once he allowed himself to get to know her and like knowing how kind she is and selfless that she is, I think it just tormented him more to realize how painful his actions were. Yeah, she follows up the conversation with how she feels about herself, that she hates herself. And she thinks that he'll be unhappy being with her. And then, of course, he goes and overcompensates with a lot of cheeriness to follow, which I don't think is the best approach either. Yeah, I think he was just doing the best that he could at the time. It's just that yeah, it's heavy, you know, and like flashbacks suck. So one thing that he needs that I have that I feel like, I mean, it's not really like the best thing, but depression fog can really be the best thing that happens to you, depending on what it is that had happened to you. Because I feel like there are moments in my life I do not remember because whatever happened was traumatic enough and I was depressed enough that I don't remember. And so sometimes I'll get little flashbacks or I'll think about something and it's just like, uh, wait, keep that wherever it is. I don't need to remember that. But I guess he, because he's holding himself accountable, like he's not allowing himself the luxury of having that. Or maybe his depression doesn't necessarily work that way. Or- yeah, I think his is much more guilt driven. So if anything, those memories are not only vivid, but maybe even amplified in a way to make him look even worse to himself. Yeah. Um, I just have one more banana split. I don't know if you have any more. Mine was, okay, so Shoya confronted Kawhi about telling Mishiba about stuff that happened when they were in school because he clearly wasn't really comfortable with his past and he was trying to make a better go of his school life, of being present. And there were people that were in the group that didn't know what he did. I mean, the most important people being Shoko and Yuzuru like knew and accepted him. But there are other people that just knew him for how he was in the moment rather than who he was in the past. And so he confronted Kawhi about it because he didn't want her to be talking about it and like gossiping in like a sort of way about it. And since she wanted to deflect blame, then she just started talking about how Shoya was a bully and she was just re-alerting not even just the friend group or the people that were part of Shoya's friend group, but the whole class, which was hurtful and unnecessary. And so then everybody ends up meeting at the bridge. You have Nagasuka, Mishiba, Kawhi, Ueno, Sahara, Shoko, and Yuzuru. I don't think that I left anybody else. I think that's it. Yeah, all of them, including Shoya, meet up at the bridge. And they're all trying to sort of nip it in the bud. But Kawhi was trying to apologize, but then also trying not to really take blame because she wasn't the worst of it. And then Ueno was just there to be there, since we all know that she's like a malicious person, especially after seeing the video from the amusement park. So anything that she said was credibly bullshit. Mashiba was there for support, whatever. Nagasuka was there. And like all of these people were around Shoko and talking about what happened. And so at that point, Shoya started hearing everybody as like this evil like noise. So similar to how when he's around people and he would see all the X's on their faces and he would like cover his ears so he could block out the noise, they started sounding noisy in that way. And he was tired of it because it's not as if they were making amends to Shoko to truly make amends. It was more of like, I'm saying this because it makes me feel good and less because they wanted her to accept that apology. And then at the same time, he already felt condemned. And so having everybody hear about what he did in the past in the classroom and people changing their point of view or him assuming that they change their point of view on like who he was as a person he just gave up and so at that point he started cutting every single person cutting everyone down why and stuff about how she is just doing this for looks 
He said it in a different way, but basically that's what he said, saying that Sahara was a coward. Nagasuka was just trying to actually still stand beside him. And then he cut him down to just say, like, you don't even like know me. Which is really sad. I feel like particularly in Nagasuka states, it's less like he was very much a ride or die friend. And he obviously had understood Shoya's character. But I mean, at that point, Shoya was just seeing all of the negative and he just wanted to get that negativity and that noise away from Shoko. So he just started cutting everybody down and they left. And so I had in my banana split because while I don't think that it was really the right way to go about it, I kind of understood it, especially in Kauai and Ueno's regard, because they have underlying motives for saying whatever it is that they're saying. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hold that to be their apology or whatever they were saying to be truthful because there was an outside force motivating them. It wasn't as if they were doing it from like their heart. They were doing it for damage control. And because Shoko is so pure, he just wanted pure people around her. Now, I think it was also wrong because I would say if he was going to cut certain people off, I fully understand with Kawhi and with Ueno, but Nagasuka, Mishiba, and Sahara didn't really deserve that. Yeah, I agree. The way I interpreted it, I think it was more of a reflexive, defensive thing on his part to start pushing people away because he's comfortable with that. Like, he knows how to handle being alone and feeling sad more than he is able to handle conflict with other people, especially especially people who know how he was when he was the worst. So I saw it more of him just resorting to pushing people away and wanting to solve the conflict and maybe not even knowing if he feels like he deserves to have the conflict solved. That's just the way I interpreted the bridge scene. I think it was self-sabotage. Yeah. Particularly in Nagasuka's case. Yeah. It was Mm self-sabotage. But I don't know. Like, I feel like it's a mix. It probably is. It's just like self-sabotage because he doesn't need those people. And the only ones he needs is Shoko and Yuzuru. But at the same time of him, like even wondering if this conflict should be resolved in his case, I wonder if he was saying all of that to say that the conflict shouldn't be resolved in their case. Because yes, he was like the worst one and he's making amends. But what they were doing, it pales in comparison to all the stuff he was doing. So maybe it's like he didn't think they were good enough to be dealing with Shoko. But that was my last banana split. Okay, I just have one more. Okay. We learned from Ueno that Shimada helped pull Shoya out of the river when he saved Shoko and fell in her place. It's nice to know that he'd do that, but I guess he didn't care enough to visit. Like, Shoya could have very well died in that coma. And if Shimada wasn't going to try to make amends then... I don't think her telling Shoya he pulled him out of the river is really accomplishing anything than just making him think about that and maybe feel bad about it somehow. I mean, I wouldn't put it past her for that to be a lie. Right, right. Oh, I've got to hate her. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hate her. She's a bitch, but it's just like, uh. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past her for that to be a lie because when they were at that amusement park, she tried to force their reconnection. Mm-hmm. And I think if anything, even though she was so attached or infatuated with um, Shoya, I feel like her personality was actually more in line with Shimada than it was with Shoya. Yeah, I agree. And so if he's able to accept Shimada again, then that means that he could accept her because they were are more alike. But the thing is, like, even to the end of the film, Shimada was like a non-motherfucking factor. Okay? Yeah. He was not trying to become friends with him at all. And, you know, maybe there was something within his subconscious that told him that Shimada was literally the worst and there was no need to try to reconcile his relationship with Shoko. Same with that one child that we never see again in the elementary school, the one that was like bigger. Mm -hmm. I don't know what his name is. I don't either. But we never see him either. And so I feel like that's just, I wouldn't put it past her for that to be like a lie. Because I think if he actually pulled him out, 
then he would have been around. Yeah, I, thinking of it from the perspective that it could be a lie makes a lot more sense than it actually being true. And it makes me hate her even more. Yeah. Do you have another banana split? No, I think it's time to drizzle some hot fudge on this Sunday. Okay, this ice cream, <laughs> it's going to be gone. It's just chocolate, all right? <laughs> it's just chocolate because I'm mad as fuck. Oh, God. <laughs> well, let it, let it go. Let it drip. First of all, let's even go from the outset, from the very beginning. As a fucking school, you mean to tell me that you have a deaf child going into this class and you aren't doing more to accomplish accommodate that child. Mm. So when you notice these children are bullying her, instead of fucking doing something from the outset or rap reprimanding Shoya enough in the beginning to at least have some sort of fear for him to do it when they aren't on school grounds, that school is a piece of fucking shit. And that homeroom teacher, he's an ass white because he's really also part of the problem because he, to me, is similar to Kawhi and that Kawhi was seeing all of this shit happen and not doing dick until the very end. Right, right. The second that Shoya started making fun of the way Shoko was reading, he should have gotten an immediate detention to start, just to start. And then any other thing after that should have been a worse punishment. But that teacher didn't do shit for that girl. Absolutely nothing. He just sit back and like watched. And it was only until like, oh, everybody's paying attention that he said something. And so for real, the way that I see it, Shogo's mom should have had eyes for that fucking teacher too. Not just Shoya's mom. Because that person is supposed to be the adult in the situation. That is supposed to be her eyes and ears. And you would think that he would say, okay, like this is what's happening in class. At least give it to her straight. This is what's going on. This is what I've witnessed. How do you want me to handle the situation if he's too chicken shit to say anything while the stuff is happening but instead it took eight hearing aids to get lost for then her mom to be like okay something's going on I know she's being bullied and then the principal comes in and then he's trying to save his ass by like targeting just Shoya and even in that moment that teacher's a piece of shit because he knows that the other people were saying stuff as well like there's no way like as a teacher shame on him right why did it have to take the principal to come in for him to be like, show you, we all know it's you. Why didn't he report that this was happening way earlier? Right, way earlier. She, He was making fun of her speech. He was talking in a certain way or whatever. First of all, that teacher is still a piece of shit because he knew that she was up. Why are you having her get up and read things? Right. Because you're only opening her up to be bullied more by having her do that. Because I know that at least, I'm not going to say I know, because it's not as if I know anybody that is deaf. But I went to college with a girl who eventually transferred to Gallaudet University in D.C., which I would have to Google it, you guys. I don't know if Gallaudet is a deaf college or if they heavily promote American Sign Language. And she wanted to learn that in the school I was going to did not offer that. And that's why she transferred. But at least based off of my conversations with her, I know when it comes to handling people that are deaf and being accommodating towards them, some of them are very sensitive to what their voice sounds like because they know it's going to sound different than everyone else. And so it's just like him not accommodating that, him just starting off in like reading rather than writing on the board, this is the chapter we're going over or whatever, leaving Shoko to have to depend on the very people that were bullying her. That teacher, you know what? Maybe, and maybe this is just a thing from anime to anime. <laughs> I'm just going to have beef with the fucking faculty because that was just bullshit. Absolutely. I'm on the same page for sure. So when Shoya's friends dumped him for bullying Shoko, it was really satisfying in that moment initially. But did they have to bully him back so hard? I feel like this is a big two wrongs don't make a right situation. It felt like justice when they dumped his books in the pond the day their class was told that eight of Shoko's hearing aids had gone missing in five months due to his bullying. But I think the fact that they continued to torture him didn't make them any better. 
You could see he was beginning to take an uncomfortable look at himself when he saw how much money his mother had to pay Shoko's mom. And then seeing his mom's earring ripped out after speaking alone with Shoko's mom, knowing that he caused that. He did that. To face bullying on top of his own guilt and realizing he needed to start to reform himself to make up for what he'd done, it's no surprise that his mental health deteriorated. Those kids prevented anyone from getting close to him to ensure he was always alone. If they really cared about Shoko so much, maybe they shouldn't have let Shoya take it so far and even sometimes participate themselves. It feels like this wasn't about Shoko. They just made Shoya the new target. Not that he didn't deserve some kind of consequences because he absolutely did. But I don't think they should have gone that far. I think that they're just as bad as him. Right. I mean, I feel like it just reminded me of like snitches get stitches, you know? Yeah. I feel like him even being bullied was because he snitched on them. And even though the homeroom teacher didn't actually take him up on the other people he was talking about or whatever, and he let those like weak ass crocodile tears that Kawhi was going through to like persuade him to think that Shoya was the only person, I feel like they were bullying him because he snitched on them Hmm. but at that point it was just kind of like fight back if these people are going to be bullying you I mean you already bullied that other girl so at this point let it just be mutual not that it's right okay disclaimer violence isn't the answer unless it's the answer in this regard but violence is not normally the answer so don't like go and take that and start doing things and say like oh Chica Supreme told me to do (laughs) Uh -uh -uh. I'm not taking any responsibility for y'all's personal actions I'm just saying in this situation if those people are doing those things to you and you did it to somebody else and like he got into a fight with Shoko at one point which I mean I know he was feeling some sort of weight but it's just like I'm just not gonna take that especially since they were just as bad so it's like if you're gonna do this to my shit I'm getting your shit I'm gonna wake up super early let me go dump your stuff into this pond let me go do all this other stuff to you let me go get what is it fire ants and then put them into your gym locker oh my I'll God. figure stuff <laughs> I'm not gonna be going down and y'all aren't going down with me like no I would be determined about it but yeah sorry (laughs) y'all okay if you guys learn anything from this episode don't mess with Chica don't (laughs) especially if if I'm not feeling like being a pacifist or whatever at that moment I'll get creative with Mm -hmm. how I'll get back at you (laughs) oh god (laughs) but in any case I wish that he would have fought back at certain times because it's like those little shits like no like I'm not gonna be the only one that gets in trouble I wouldn't even let that be the only time I said that those people were involved I would have gone to the principal too because like hell I'm going to be dealing with all that stuff. And if he actually got all the rest of them in trouble for real and their parents got involved, I'm sure it would have paid for all of the hearing aids. Not that we're going to go calculate it, guys. Right. But all of the eight hearing aids that got messed up because they were there too. Yeah. I mean, as far as Shoya fighting back goes, I think after he saw how this affected his mother, this affected his family, that might have been when the guilt started. Maybe he felt like he didn't deserve to fight back. Or rather, maybe he felt like he deserved their bullying in return because of what he did. So he didn't have the strength or the confidence or rather the self-love to fight back. I believe that is the correct interpretation. I just, I'll just like, y'all, I already went into it. Yes. (laughs) Either way. So... Later on, Yuzuru and Shoko wrap Shoya up in a birthday party that they want to throw for their mother. And the entire thing is so uncomfortable. She doesn't seem very grateful that her kids went to the trouble to throw her a little surprise bash. Like, I know Shoya's not on her good side, but she didn't even try to fuss that her kids baked her a a banging ass looking strawberry short cake. I feel like the emotional center in their family was their grandmother. And so once the grandmother was gone, then their mom was dealing with, and this isn't to say like, I just feel like Shoko's mom is just 
I feel like she's in general just a banana split type of character for me. Yeah. But I think that just the weight of everything was just on her. I'm certain that, you know, when the grandmother was like around, it's not like her grandmother was like working, Mm -hmm. but it's sort of like having like free childcare in a way. But it's like the grandmother wasn't working. So she's the one that's working because we don't see either of their fathers, Shoya or Shoka. We don't see their fathers. So we don't see a two income household. And especially when you have a child that is disabled like those types of costs like rack up like I don't know if the sign language center if it's free or if she has to pay for some sort of membership for Shoko to attend doctor's appointments I'm certain like all those things like add up and then on top of the fact that her own mother had just passed away I just don't think she was emotionally I don't think she was fully there yeah I guess I mean I feel like if anything all of that to see that your kids took the time to do something special for you so you could sit down and eat some sweets and celebrate your life. And maybe a smile, at least an attempt, but there's nothing. Yeah. But that's why it's a hot take. Yeah, I get it. Do you have anything else on their hot fudge? Oh, I know. Oh, yes. She's more like ice cream, you scream, because I don't think my dislike for her is like a hot take, but... Yes, you feel free to go ahead. So when Ueno started putting hands on Shoko's mom mm. and Shoko's mom fought back, I was like, yes, okay, this is the bitch that deserves the hand. Yeah. Okay, Shoya might have been doing whatever he was doing in the past, but she was in his fucking ear with that mess. And so for me, especially seeing her put hands on Shoko's mom, and she clearly knows that's her mom. I'm just like, bro, throw her. Okay, let me not. Okay, mm-hmm. reel a bit, reel it in, reel, reel it in, it in. Reel reel it in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold you back. That would have been real bad. <laughs> real. <laughs> okay, but seeing her like physically hitting Shoko after knowing what happened, then hitting her mom, I was so livid. Because to be honest, and it's not to say that Shoko wouldn't have tried to kill herself, but what she said in that Ferris wheel really pushed her. Oh, even yeah. more to like think that this is the only way that she could fix everything because she ruined Shoya's life and Ueno added to that narrative. And so to see her then act as if she's so bothered meanwhile, and it's like I can forgive his mom because she doesn't know all of the bullshit that Ueno was doing. Shoya did not like that girl. He was done with her because she's similar to Shaman. He was not trying to deal with her and not trying to have her around. He didn't want to give Shoko the wrong impression during that time when Ueno tried to get on his bike because she just went from, I'm going to place all blame on you for this bullying thing. Now I'm infatuated with you because you came to my cat cafe one time and now I'm going to act like we're in this relationship. Anyway. So just seeing her like put hands on Shoko's mouth, I was so pissed. Guys, I was cooking on the inside. I do not like her. And they try to redeem her in Shoko, like just being there to possibly talk to her and to hold the umbrella for her. I was so upset because I felt that just like the way that Shimada, we saw him at the amusement park and then that was it. Really, Ueno could have just stopped at that point too because she's such a negative character. There really wasn't anything for me that could have been done to redeem her character. No, I don't see her as redeemable at all. That was my hot fudge. I have one more. Okay. So I know this isn't a shoujo. This is technically a shonen. Yeah. But I will never not be the romance girl. And it bothers me that there's no resolution to Shoko's feelings for Shoya. We get the idea that Shoya likes her too, but I think it would take a long time before he could ever deem himself worthy to even hold her hand. He's making progress, but I don't think he's forgiven himself for what he's done yet. I woke up the next morning after watching the movie thinking about this. Like, what if in the dream, at the end of his coma, he had come to the realization of these deeper feelings for her, and that jump-started his heart so much that it woke him up? What if he saw the moon in this dream and it reminded him of Shoko and he thought like, I miss her, she's this and that, and finally landing on I like her. And then it finally dawns on him that by Suki, the moon, she really meant Suki, I like you. 
And I know not everything needs a romantic resolution, but the Suki versus Suki thing was such a big misunderstanding that I felt like it had to lead somewhere and it didn't. And that's that's like one of the only gripes I have with this film. Men. Men. (laughs) Because, like, I'm telling you, if this was a show, Joe, that shit would have been resolved. I'd like to think so anyway. I think just the sheer fact that Yuzuru found out what was going on. And I am fully there for her not telling him what Shoko meant. Yes. I am 100% there. But I feel that she could have been encouraging her to say something. Because if he's that dense, he's dense enough not to even know his feelings. Right. If Yuzuru could have just encouraged, just tell him. Just try again. Just sign it. Do it in a different way. Yeah, do it in a different way. Yeah. Also very silly, which I didn't know where to put it because it's really not I scream, you scream, but it's related to the Saki thing. In that scene, this is a very Gianna thing. This is really no comment on the film itself. There's a missed opportunity for symbolism in that scene because it pans up to the moon and we see a waning crescent moon. I'm, I'm Gianna Luna, guys. The moon phases are a big part of my life. They could have had the moon waxing, and I think that would have been a really beautiful, subtle touch. Because a waxing moon is gaining momentum and growing, but a waning moon is getting smaller and going away. So I just, that was just my little, I wish they had this symbolism, but they did not. And it's okay. It didn't affect my film experience at all. Yeah, I think it would have just been nice, you know, even in the midst of all of that. I think him apologizing and him asking her to help him live. Shoko girl, if you just confessed again. I know the first time I saw that movie, when they met on that bridge, I'm like, oh my God, it's going to happen here. And it didn't. Yeah. And it made me sad. There's, there's no resolution. And it felt like such a big part of her character. And we didn't get to see that come to fruition for her. Yeah. So that's my main gripe, of course, is the unresolved room. Right. I feel like we're going to end up doing a manga retrospective. Mm -hmm. I feel like this needs to be in my collection. Oh, same. So if it's in my collection, it means that Gianna is also going to (laughs) say. Yay. So, which reminds me of you guys. If you are listening, post us doing this giveaway. Thank you for being a new listener. We totally appreciate it. Mm-hmm. I hope you like all of the rest of our content as well, even when we're, when we're not talking about Shonen because this is more of a rarity than a regularity. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the manga volumes. We thought it would be a perfect gift for people that love the series and love the movie the way that we love the movie. Mm-hmm. So I would love to do a manga retrospective because if if they really ended the manga that way, <laughs> I will be so pissed. I just want it to be like, you know, I want it to be like a film thing. Like ugh, they just decided not to get into all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least like, you know, epilogue, like they're together or something. Right. Like I don't see this ending in any way that's not them together in the future. Yeah. They have to be together. I just, I would really want like if they have side stories, just a side story of her finally confess or maybe a side story of of him confessing. Oh, wait. Okay, if we don't get this, if there if we get the manga and we read it and there's no resolution, I will write it for everyone, okay? Yes. <laughs> We will do another fanfic episode. (laughs) Please give me an excuse to have fanfiction time, guys. I want to write more. It'll be so much fun. But I feel like side story, if she doesn't reconfess or the side story is him confessing to her and then she's just like, I've loved you all this time. And then it's like flashback scene to when she said it and screwed up. Mm. Diana will have to write it because (laughs) I don't want to write it against anybody. (laughs) Yeah. If it doesn't happen, we're going to make it happen, y'all. Yeah, we got you. Yeah. Do you want to try and get through I Scream, You Scream really quick? I know we're going super long again. Yeah, we can do it. Okay. I have a very, very silly nitpick. I think that Shoya and Shoko's names are too similar for the leads. They can be very easily mixed up. I think it was something they could have just changed, but didn't. I didn't look into the meanings of their names, though, and if it's significant, but very similar names for your two leads. Yeah, because like sometimes I was struggling when we're recapping because it's like, uh... (laughs) 
Yeah. Shoko, I mean Shoya. And then, oh, it means, Shoya's name means fly high. Okay. We're getting live results, y'all. <laughs> so, so Shoya's name means fly high. Shoko means bright, clear happiness. Oh. Um, oh. Oh no, my entire oh. heart just got ripped out of my chest. So perfect, y'all. Okay. Okay, I'm done. It's not a nitpick anymore. <laughs> that's officially in Floats Your Boat now. My bad. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. But yeah, it was a little difficult. I'm sure that there's another another name that might mean the same thing, y'all. That might have helped. Right, something similar. But uh, we do like the name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's hard recapping, but it doesn't mean that we don't like it. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, without even having to elaborate, I feel like it goes without saying that the bullying was all an ice cream, you scream, but we've already touched on that so deeply that I don't think I have to say anything more than that. Yeah, I think I touched on the ableism. Mm -hmm. That's ice cream, you scream for me. Ueno and Kawhi being two-faced bitches is ice cream, you scream for me. Yeah. Yeah. And the redemption. Yeah, I feel like I'm trying to see if there's anything. Uh, I do have one point left. I think the casual cruelty of his classmates, I'm not used to it. And I think primarily this is, I mean, just in general throughout the whole thing, like everyone just sort of being bystanders to it and not standing up for him or saying anything positive. But also I would say... um when he came back. So he was in like a coma and everything and he came back and obviously Shoko can't hear what these people are talking about, but they are saying like, oh, didn't he try to kill himself? Yeah. And saying just all of these mean things and it's like, he just came back and y'all are already talking shit. Are you serious? And that's why he was like so nervous and that's, it was good because it was nice t- for him to be able to rely on Shoko in that moment to tell her how he sees people. Well, I mean, how he actually doesn't see people and that he has that social anxiety and for her to comfort him. But I just think if somebody comes back from that and it's like even if you thought he killed himself, why would you openly gossip about that when he's in earshot? Right. The cruelty of it, I'm not used to it because it's like I feel that people should have a certain level of human decency in how they treat people, you know? Yeah. Like unless they did something heinous and harmful to you or to like a loved one, like that is entirely unnecessary. Yeah, that really upset me too to see that they went immediately into gossip mode instead of maybe just taking a look at him, noting that he's back maybe to themselves, and then just going about the day at the festival. Yeah. So when Ueno first sees Shoko out on the street when she's buying those cute little garden pot decorations for Shoya, she just walks up to her and picks up the bullying where they left off as kids. It made my blood boil. Like she's truly learned nothing. And I mean, of course, we can go on and on about Ueno and such and such. I do have just one more comment about her too. Mm. I think that Shoya could have stopped her from taking Shoko on the Ferris wheel to begin with. Like, how could she possibly say that Shoko didn't try to understand her when they were kids, when she literally did the best she could to communicate? Like, I know you already talked about the, you already talked about the Ferris wheel, but it's all just so frustrating. And I feel like Shoya just could have stepped in and intervened and stopped her from dragging her to the Ferris wheel, but he didn't. To be honest, I think after the amusement park thing, I feel like it would have been better for him to have just articulated the type of person that Ueno was. Like, the way that Yuzuru was super protective of Shoko when Shoya came into the picture is how I felt she needed to be with Ueno around. I think that having somebody be that hostile and mean towards your sister, it doesn't matter if she's coming over to apologize because somebody like that hasn't even shown, or not shown, gone the same lengths as Shoya to gain that forgiveness. So nothing that she says is like credible or valid. And I feel that especially after Ueno tried to force that meetup between um, Shimada and Shoya, that at that point, he should have just disinvited her. Yeah, I think it's just because he was caught in that momentary feeling of he doesn't like him. He doesn't want anything to do with him. And then thinking, well, here I am trying to get redeemed. Can I say that he's irredeemable? But he knows that Ueno is not redeemable Mm -hmm. because of what 
what she's been saying because of the actions she's been taking, what she's been saying on the side. It was very similar to how they were when they were in elementary school. And so if she's saying all of that and she's saying the same things now, yes, it could have been like a test from the director or the filmmaker or whatever to say like, here she is saying this stuff and she's invoking that temptation, right? Because in the past, she could just say whatever and he would just act on it. And now we're seeing him in a, like a reformed light in a better way. And it's like, okay, he's not falling to that quote unquote temptation of like being rude or being mean to Shoko. But I feel that at the same time, he could have gone for like more he could have said you know what I feel that you need to leave because if you're saying these sort of things around Shoko if you're trying to reunite me with a painful part of my past then you are not worthy to take part in me reconciling with Shoko Mm -hmm. yeah and also on the note of him questioning whether or not he can label someone as irredeemable when he himself doesn't know if he is. He's reformed. He's changed so much. Meanwhile, Shimada and Ueno are still bullies in their own right. Yeah. So it's definitely valid for him to be able to say that they're not currently redeemable. It doesn't mean that they never will be or could be. But right now, they certainly aren't. Yeah. And I just feel like Shoko didn't need to go through what happened at the Ferris wheel. I think that it could have been perfectly avoided, especially given the fact of like, she literally just talked about how if Shoko was in in the picture, then things would be back to the way that it was. Yeah. So if she can say that in front of you, who knows what the hell she was going to say in that Ferris wheel? Why would you even allow that to happen? Right. If she's saying that stuff to you. Exactly. It's just horrible. Yeah. Guys, I'm going to say it. Maybe Gianna will edit this out. But during the hot fudge when I was talking about Shoko's mom, like fighting Ueno, I just was just push her off the building, man. Like, that's yeah. just, I know that's fucked up. It's just I was so <laughs> the whole building. Building. I mean, not for real, guys. Don't actually push people. Don't no, do that. No, we don't promote violence. No, no. I don't pro- <laughs> No, but I hate that girl. Yes. And fittingly, my last ice cream you scream is about away now. <laughs> so... At the very end of the movie, when they're all sort of getting back together at the festival, Ueno infiltrates the group and she shows that she learned moron in sign language. Like it's supposed to be endearing or like she's just teasing Shoko because they're like low-key friends now. I just want her to go away. It means nothing. She's redeemed nothing. I still hate her. There was nothing cute about it. All right. So like you're signing that she's a moron, but like she said it out loud. So I'm just like, okay y'all gang gang where's the rest of y'all to be like she's not a moron right why are you calling her this this is the first time that they're back and you're going to talk about like you know that that sort of mentality of they don't need to go through any extra shit so you calling her a moron like what does that even do because her learning how to do that like what is it no no it's so stupid yeah it's like girl he doesn't want you he didn't want you when he was awake (laughs) like before he was in the coma he didn't want you after he was in a coma so why you're still around maybe you also don't love yourself because let me tell you something i don't need somebody to tell me more than once that they don't like me Mm -hmm. you aren't gonna see me if i know that you don't like me Mm -hmm. i'm definitely not gonna make anybody miserable just because i don't get what i want either gross yeah god oh she's the worst but I think that wraps up a silent voice going Okatachi. Yes, we did it, guys. We did our first film. Woo! What did you think of our recap? Did you like it? Did you not like it? If you didn't like it, please provide constructive criticism. That's nice. Yes. Send it to our email, shoujosundaypodcast at gmail.com. Yes. You can also put whatever you feel in the comments because we post our new episodes across social media. So if you're on Facebook, like our podcast page, comment on the particular episode to let us know your thoughts. If you're on Instagram, you know what to do. Do the same thing. Twitter, do the same thing. We definitely want to engage with you guys. We're so happy that you've been on this ride with us thus far. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was just great to go over such an impactful film. If y'all have ideas that associate with our segments, what was your ice cream, you scream of the film or your 
floats your boat. Oh, yeah. Or your hot fudge. I'd love to hear some rocky roads from people because I know we weren't the only ones crying. Right. We can cry together, y'all. Like, just let us know what it is. Yeah. We'll commiserate. We'll share. Anyway, you can follow Shoujo Sunday across all social platforms. Also, follow this podcast on your preferred podcast platform, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Podcast, Audible, wherever you hear us, follow us on there. Rate us five stars so that more people can hear from us and see us. And I am Chica Supreme. You can follow me um, across all socials, Chica Supreme. That's with a K. Gianna? I am at Gianna underscore Luna underscore. And that's Gianna with one N. So you can find me at that everywhere. Yay. So that wraps up A Silent Voice. So we will be back next week to talk about the new series that we're going to be getting into. You will see the announcement on our social media. Yes. But yes, a new series, new journey. Let's go, guys. Oh, I can't wait. We'll see you then. Yeah. Bye. Bye.